This is the Defenders Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're back with Secret Invasion for the penultimate episode, Harvest. I was wondering when you were going to call. You'd like to think you're a step ahead of me, Fury. Oh, oh you're a jet, man. I need rocket fuel to stay ahead of you. <laughs> I got a deal for you. Got anything to do with the harvest? Bring it to me in person. I'll call the whole thing off. Call what thing off? I thought you were a step ahead of me. I'm raising the stakes, Fury. If I don't get what I want, your president's gonna bomb New Skrullos, and the war is on. Bring some iodide pills. The reactor room can be touch aggressive. Welcome back, fellow defenders, to TV Podcast Industries. We're back with Secret Invasion, Episode 5, Harvest. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. And rounding out this duo, Mm -hmm. I am Chris. Yes, Yes, we are sans our third leg of the podcasting team. (laughs) Yes, John has been taken by Little Green Men once again. Yes, he is. He's gone again. I hope you mean like as in a three-legged chair, not a four-legged chair with only three legs, Chris. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's the- I was making a double entendre of, or okay. kind of, but like, sure, we can do it that way too. <laughs> All good. Yeah, John is away uh, visiting his family uh, in the UK at the moment. So, uh, so we are going to crack on with Secret Invasion with Adam. I am. Um, I know he's going to have enjoyed watching this episode though. Um, had some great moments in here. Yeah, and it goes to sunny old the UK as well. He does. He sunny does. old London, where they shoot people in the leg. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Yes. <laughs> well, all good. Uh, remember, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, you can subscribe by going over to tvpodcastindustries.com. We'd also love to hear your feedback on Secret Invasion. Uh, lots of stuff out there um, about Secret Invasion. We hope you've been enjoying the series so far, but we've only got one episode left, so we'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on what on how you felt the season has gone so far. You can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or pop on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries where you can leave your thoughts to any of the spoiler posts for any of the shows that we cover over there. And remember, we do have the fifth question in our Secret Invasion pub quiz, uh, where you have the opportunity to win some Secret Invasion goodies at the end of the series. All you need to do is ca- gather together all six answers to the six questions that we pose and email them to us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. But we'll get to that a little bit later on. But without further ado, then Derek, do you want to tell me who gave us what, where, when, how with this episode details? Absolutely, yes. The executive producers for the show, once again, Kevin Feige, Jonathan Schwartz, Louis Esposito, Brad Winderbaum, Samuel L. Jackson, Elise Lim, Kyle Bradstreet, and Brian Tucker. Head writer for the show, of course, Kyle Bradstreet, and all episodes of the series have been directed by Elise Lim. This episode was written by Michael Bim and Brian Tucker. Uh, Brian Tucker, of course, writer on each of the episodes so far. Um, This is Michael Bim's first Marvel TV episode. He previously worked on shows as diverse as high school American football show All American and British murder mystery Vera. How far apart can you get in your TV writing? (laughs) I was going to say, neither of those. The only thing I can kind of go, oh, he must have pulled from is like the the cottage scene where they set fire to the cottage. And I'm like, okay, maybe murder mystery cottage. Yeah, you know, (laughs) British countryside. Maybe maybe go for the investigation part of Vera, the uh, Brenda Blethyn investigating things that are going on. He's taken that over to uh, to Nick Fury. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's what he's doing. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> but I, way, I just thought was, that was very far apart on his, uh, on yes. his IMDb. So congratulations, Michael. You've got uh, obviously lots of work ahead of you if you're able to work for such diverse shows. Definitely. When you can work again. Exactly, exactly. So Chris, do you want to tell us what they gave us with the synopsis for this episode of Secret Invasion, Episode 5, Harvest? Call cool, blimey, sure. <laughs> Sorry, that's my best John. That's a terrible John. Thank you. Following the murder of Talos, Fury brings U.S. President Ritson to the hospital. He tries to guard him, but Rhodey and his team arrive to take over. He drives Fury away by releasing a video showing him killing former S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Maria Hill. Fury returns to his hideout in Brixton where he meets Gaia. 
She's looking to bury her father, so Fury sends her to his home, where his wife Priscilla will take care of the ceremony. He explains that Talos didn't lose. He chose the path of struggle, but now it's her time. And with her new powers, she can take on Gravik, but he needs to go to Finland first. Meanwhile, Gravik's plan hasn't worked out the way he wanted to. When Pagon challenges him in front of the rest, he's killed and Gravik tells the rest of his lieutenants they have no voice and shouldn't question his plans. They attempt to overthrow Gravik, but with his own super scroll ability, he kills them all. Gravik reaches out to Skull Rhodey to enact his new plan. Rhodey is to convince the US president to destroy new Skrullos dropping bombs in Russia. But it's a ruse to convince Fury to hand over the DNA of all of Earth's mightiest heroes to him. He also sends his troops to execute Priscilla for her failure to murder Fury. After giving her father a traditional Skrull send-off, Gaia helps Priscilla survive the attack on her life and Priscilla drops her off on her next mission. Following a plane ride to Finland, piloted by the ever-resourceful smuggler Rick Mason, Fury reunites with Sonya Fallsworth. She learns Rhodey is a Skrull aligned with Gravik and that Fury's personal connection to the Skrulls means he doesn't want any innocent members of their species to die. He retrieves a vial from his grave and all his necessary equipment telling Sonya he's going to trade with Gravik to save the planet. He makes one final call and tells his contact, it's time, let's finish this. Do you know, it's constantly amazing me how short these episodes are getting and how much they're cramming into them. Yeah. Like, they really are. They're traveling around the world here. They've got, like, three different countries here. Uh, lots of stuff going on. Uh, lots of big moments. And we're the episodes now, the last three, I think, have been 32 minutes, 33 minutes. Uh, yeah. With credits with, and, and yeah. preview. Um, so uh, feeling about the length of uh, of a She-Hulk episode, effectively. So uh, it'll be interesting. I wonder, will, I wonder, will they do an extended episode next week? As the Potentially. They did originally say that, remember, they were going to, the whole thing about how many episodes per season we were going to get. If it was 30 something, we were going to get eight. If it was 40 plus, we were going to get six. That was one of the original, back in the day when they first discussed, when they started One Division, they were like, that's how it's going to go. Yeah, they kind of said that that's, uh, Overall, all the shows will add up to, uh, what's it, three hours, is it, if, yeah. if you multiply eight by 30 minutes? Um, and then they would either split them into six episodes or eight or nine episodes, basically, depending on on, uh, on what length they want to, want to tell. But the other thing they've said, of course, is that as it's a streaming service, they can choose what the cutoff point is on an episode. They don't, they don't have to go to a time that will fit yeah. network television, for example, the way that you would have used to have done with your episodes for shows. So, um, so they are ending every week on a, uh, on a cliffhanger, uh, yes. as we, as we can see every, every time they've ended an episode. And it, it does feel like a natural ending to the episodes each week. It doesn't feel like you're adding in 10 minutes just to make up a time. So, no, I, I'd agree. I agree that I'm adding mm-hmm. in to, to make up time. Yeah. That being said, I could use. Maybe a, a kind of extra few minutes here and there on some of the conversations, mm-hmm. like just even around the scroll religion that we see with the, the funeral, mm. the the scroll, the scrollian. No, the scrolly, I, I think they're the just scroll called funeral. funeral. Scroll. I just can't. <laughs> I just called you krill just, there, so uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, overall, I just think every now and again, I'd like, oh yeah, give me an extra two minutes just for dialogue exposition. Yeah. I think that's more because I'm enjoying the show and mm-hmm. could take a lot more from it but you're right it's definitely shorter end but it does make sense also because uh you were telling me off air just before we started that they are putting the first couple of episodes of this in uh on uh, on terrestrial tv well, the first three episodes of uh, Secret Invasion, yes, they're going to be available from the 21st of July, uh, the day after we record this, uh, are going to be available on Hulu. Um, so if you don't have a Disney Plus subscription, which I would be surprised if anybody listening to this episode uh, doesn't have a Disney Plus True. subscription, but uh, but yes, it will be available for everybody else to watch the first three episodes uh, as we head into the finale next week, which is really interesting. They also announced that Miss Marvel is going to be available on uh, regular terrestrial TV on ABC in the US, um, so that'll have ad breaks in and all that kind of stuff uh, coming up in September. So all leading up to the Marvels later on this year. So uh, lots of opportunities for people to see both of those shows, which lead directly into uh, the Marvels. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, Yeah. no, totally. Well, let's get into our top case points for this episode. We've got three major case points uh, we're going to talk about from this episode. I think I want to start with with Gravik. Um, 
and the descent in Gravik's ranks and his new plan. Um, it's been kind of interesting over the course of the season. Uh, Gravik seems to be a bit reactionary um, in the season. It's been difficult to kind of get under the skin of what his plan is, other than the Skrulls want to take over the world, right? Um, yeah. they, th- in the first episode, we thought the plan was that he was going to release dirty bombs, and that would uh, end off causing lots of damage, lots of mayhem. Um, it turned out that he was uh, he wanted to uh, release bombs in a Russian square and blame that bombing on uh, on U.S. dissidents, effectively. So he would create some uh, tension between Russia and the U.S. Later, he had a plan that he was going to take out uh, the UN plane, which, again, I don't think actually exists in uh, in our world, but he was going to take out UN-1, the plane, which would cause another international incident. But that was another plan to draw Fury out so, um, and to draw the spy out, excuse me, which was Gaia. Um, and that's, that's where he found out that she was a spy. And now here we have a, a new plan, which is effectively he wants it revealed to the US president that the Skrulls are working with Russians so that the US bomb Russia starting potentially a nuclear war or World War Three between uh, the US and, and Russia. Um, so he's also had the plan, of course, last episode, which we saw him try to carry out to kill the president of the US, which would have set the minds of the world uh, on fire, as they say. So, um, so yeah, lots of different plans from Gravik, but another flip here. Does Gravik really have a strong plan? You know, Gaia seemed quite convinced of what is, that he had a plan that was going to allow the scrolls to take over Earth, but does he have a strong plan, or do you think that his transformation into this super scroll, these new abilities that he's gotten, have started to make him really cocky, make him really arrogant? Is he changing his plan as he's going? Because it seems like his real motivation is to get more scroll powers, more superpowers, effectively. So I, by the end of this episode, I am split. So there's two different options. One, uh, I the, this has all been about the harvest. So mm-hmm. his great plan is, yeah, give me, I need more, I need powers. I need, no matter what happens, they will send the Avengers or Captain Marvel against us. So I need the harvest of Fury. So I'm going to keep pushing Fury to a point where he's going to have to give me that. So mm. that's like, so he has been upping the ante and it's true his motivations have just been to get the harvest mm. but even even that's a change isn't it because he did say that he was trying to get the dna so that he could create create an army of super scrolls he's the only one with scroll powers now these superpowers that have yeah. been added to him he has an entire group of lieutenants who he's told in this episode shut up you have no name you have no voice don't question me they were supposed to be the lieutenants with superpowers yeah so another change there from him no it's true like I said, that was partially what I did think. I think, like, he just wants the harvest so that he can make the army. Mm-hmm. But at the moment, he's the general and he's the one with the power. Yeah. What I want to call the the breakdown, almost, of Gravik mm-hmm. mentally, or kind of... He seems to be uh, teetering on an edge of just pure emotion. Like, and I wonder how much... Ha- like, he started with a plan. He mm-hmm. did have the plan, and there's the one he spoke with Gaia. And because Fury has, to a degree, jumped around on his plan, been like sidestepped his plans, mm-hmm. and kind of, to a degree, stopped parts of his plans, yeah. like UN one. But he's like, oh no, no, that wasn't my plan at all. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, no, it's uh, I, I really wanted the the mole, mm-hmm. uh, and because that's been consistently happening, he's getting more and more, um aggressive and loose and like Mm -hmm. his he's he's no longer being the tactician the general he's just becoming more i was gonna say homicidal but yeah essentially homicidal because he kills two people in this episode Mm -hmm. of his own lieutenants and And i think that breakdown in his psyche uh that's where i'm leaning towards now which is he's basically the the transformation with colosidians kind of brutish brutish nature mm-hmm. kind of maybe that's it maybe because it wasn't the smartest thing he was basically <laughs> hulkish mm. uh, and he just kind of had rage in him um, and that's part of that so i was like is that what's driving him now yeah uh, additionally because curie has seemingly been a step ahead of him mm. uh, now he says 
on the call to Fury, no, 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 I'm ahead of you. I'm always one step ahead of you. Mm -hmm. Remember that. But it does actually ring somewhat to what um, Maria Hill said in the very first episode. Where is Fury and the man who was always three steps ahead? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, maybe we've, and we talked about this in episode one and episode two in our discussion, maybe Fury is. Yeah. Maybe Fury has been. Fury knew this was like, what he, like he always wanted the harvest. That's all he he's been prepping all of these things to mm-hmm. ensure that Gravik essentially makes a muck up of all of this. Yeah, and then like brings the scrolls into the world light in front of the presence, and it's all about then. Yep, Fury is the man who saves it. And you know what? There was also these all these other good scrolls who helped. Yeah, absolutely, because, you know, the new story that we see at the beginning of the episode shows Talos saving the president, and the, yeah. the narrative that's come out is there are aliens on Earth, and they're here to help, almost. It's, it's what's kind of coming out there. So this story that Rhodey's telling to the president on behalf of Gravik that they're working with the Russians, they were there, uh, you saw them, Mr. President, kind of thing, here's, here's where they are in Russia. I feel like that's got a left on a cliffhanger, as a question, because I don't think the president's making any decision off the back of, you know, one advisor walking into him telling him to start World War Three. Um, but I think it's left for the president to kind of go, well, hang on a second. I was saved by a scroll effectively. Yeah. You know, that's what he's, that's what's there on the news. So, um, but it is also interesting with the descent within Gravix ranks. You know, we, we hear from Pogon and I think Pogon does have a point when he's telling Gravik that he doesn't have the ability to kill Fury. He doesn't have the ability to carry out his plans. He's questioning the orders that he's being given from Gravik because he's been unable to uh, to to carry out any anything that he's telling them to do. He gets killed for it. He's told that his mission was to kill the president, and he didn't achieve that. So he's killed for it. But it feels like it's more questioning Gravik's orders now. Gravik seems like. While he is quite emotionless, he seems pretty pissed off that Fury has thwarted him on on this big yeah. plan, right? Yeah, and it does seem like that the the unrest has been teetering there for a while because mm-hmm. when they go after him, they all go after him. Yeah, absolutely, like a large proportion to the point where it spills out into the general population, mm-hmm. and Gravik kills. The lieutenant, the new kid, Beto, right yeah. in front of all these innocent bystanders. Yeah, absolutely. Because if, if you remember all the way back to the first introduction of Beto coming to this utopia almost for scrolls, come come here, you can live your life in your own skin. He's being told it's a perfect community, somewhere we can all live together. But you can also choose to be a soldier where we will get our ability to live on Earth free. Um, and now we're seeing that actually this crazy guys on at the at the forefront front of it willing to sacrifice everybody um including himself if that's what it takes yeah um but also willing to kill other people that don't agree with him um one of the things i would have liked to see uh, at this stage now where i think it's been three episodes since we saw them the council of uh, of scroll infiltrators that have been across the world it feels like that's kind of has been dropped. It's like as if they said, right, you're now our leader, Gravik, and now he's going off on his own and not even speaking to them. I'd like yeah. to have seen another moment of him, you know, either sharing what his plan is or or talking to them about a plan. You know, he is the leader of that circle, but I, I, I thought we'd see them again. I thought it was a bit of a surprise to not see any of them again. I assume we'll see them in the next one. At the end of everything, like it's going to be, oh, well, that's nightly wrapped up and welcome to the new one. Gaia, Maybe. you're now taking over from your father, who was the general. Now you're the new general, Gaia. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's possible. Or Gaia and Priscilla. Yeah, yeah. That's entirely possible. I, yeah. I, I just think it's it's odd that we wouldn't have seen uh, that that yeah. group. Uh, uh, Gravik does seem to be going off on his own quite a lot here. Um, but it was a great scene. I, I thought it was fantastic. There was a moment there, and because I think because you talked quite often about, you know, is Gravik the real leader? Is is there somebody else behind him? Is there yeah. the Empress of of uh, of Skrullos? Is she going to come out of the shadows? I was watching that scene, going, "Are they going to kill Gravik? What a great moment that would be in episode five to kill off who we thought was the major major leader, and then the real." bad guy yeah. comes out of the shadows is that the way it's going to work what a great twist for the show i absolutely thought he was going to die there but to see him fight everybody off and then slip beto's throat in front of 
the regular population that are outside the non-soldiers that are supposed to be in a community being taken care of. I thought it was a fantastic scene to see his anger and his aggression coming out and yeah. his um, intolerance for any form of action against him. And he's got the powers to stop it. That was great. Yeah. I, I was right there with you. I mm. literally thought they were going to kill him. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I called this to a degree. Yeah. But I was like, oh no, this is great. Like, this is the real graphic. Please stand up kind of thing. <laughs> like, literally, we were going to get that. And it was, I, I had, I am somewhat disappointed because essentially what I do see now with this graphic piece is he's just going to be a man of fury. He's angry. <laughs> And it's going to be Fury versus Fury mm-hmm. in the next <laughs> episode. Kind of. And I'm like, yeah, this is, that's cool. But like, uh-huh. this was being billed more as that kind of very much in my head, that uh, thriller noir spy. Mm. And I was like, oh, there's going to be some twists and turns. Mm-hmm. I'm just, that uh, just with the graphic character, mm-hmm. the, the enemy here. I've yet to see that twist and turn yet. I'm like, oh no, I really want, I'm hoping there is a one in the final because okay. he is very, I don't want to say one dimensional. I, I don't think he is at all. I think he's, I think he's changing a lot on screen. He's not one dimensional because you cannot predict what he's going to do yeah. <laughs> in any episode. It feels like he's changing his plan and he's getting more frustrated um, with the plan. Effectively, he does have a very basic plan, which is nuke the world and we can, take over yes. right and whatever it takes to accomplish that if the nuclear weapons drop nuclear bombs drop on the planet they can walk the earth and all humans are dead he does have that basic one but this antagonism that he has in there for fury um is really coming out it's like he wants to really stick it to fury make him watch while he takes over the world and fury's not that kind of person he's not playing ball in that way anything else about those scenes any anything about uh about Rody and uh and the president uh at all do you want to bring into this chris yeah for me this was just again Rody the the R- riva rava uh i believe that the, the is the name of the the scroll yes rava um, um kindly pointed out uh by one of our our uh listeners because we were going round and round about how important is this character and uh one of our wonderful listeners on our facebook page uh sent us the uh, screenshot of the cast from last week's episode and said it was right there you should have just looked at the cast list yeah. so uh, so this is not a character that we know from anything else at all we didn't need to go and check uh all the other uh movies and shows uh her name is listed in the credits as rava yeah. so she, and the only comic book She's in a few comic books. Huh? She's a pirate scroll. <laughs> That's it. She's a pirate scroll with a scar and okay. two, two mag- kind of sci-fi magic key swords. Okay. That's it. Like okay. very different. To not the not just not a, what just a we, name taken from a comic rather than any kind of characterization. Yes. Then okay, exactly. Okay. Um, so with Rhodey or with this character, I enjoyed this scene, this back and forth with Fury as uh, kind of Rhodey is heading in. Mm-hmm. Um. And that kind of, I want to call it cockiness. Oh, yeah. Where it's just this, this aggressive cockiness against, we've won, you're done. Mm-hmm. And that's where they think they are, uh, where Rody ends up going in the present. We're going to bomb, we need to bomb Russia, let's do it now. Everyone's mm-hmm. going to be behind us, yada, yada. They've taken the the very short piece out of uh, Age of Ultron on Rody. Where he's telling that story in the party. Mm-hmm. And I was like, boom, is this what you're looking for? That type of kind of cocky roadie where he's trying to impress everyone. Yeah. They've taken that one little piece and they've blown it up into this cocky new roadie character. And I'm like, that's clever. Mm-hmm. It's really clever. Great way of portraying it because we know roadie is not that character. We, we, through all the movies, we know. War Machine is way more layered, way better. Absolutely. But they've just taken that cockiness, and I'm like, it's very clever. Mm-hmm. It's a choice, and it worked out so well. Yeah. I'm just wanting to see more. Like, I can't wait till they actually cut Rhodey in front of everyone, because uh, they're going to have to uh, reveal for the president. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I can't wait to see that one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, Hopefully, looking forward to seeing actual Rowdy back in the future of the MCU as well. Um, because this character is, yeah, vindictive, cruel, evil. We mentioned it last week. Um, and the threat that 
this that, that rather this uh, the scroll made to Fury last week to get rid of him was if you don't go, I'm going to release the footage of you murdering Maria Hill this week now. It's already been released without even speaking yeah. to Fury. He's released that information to the world. So um so that was quite uh, quite interesting. Now Fury, the most wanted man on the planet, um because yeah. he murdered a shield agent in Russia. So uh, a very interesting um twist there. I, yeah. And oh, yes, next week we have to find Rhodey. Next week they're they're going to have to find all the hidden people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. We'll just, we'll just have to wait and see that one when is it the last thing? Kind of like an arc opening kind of thing. <laughs> I don't think it's the last thing. I think we'll we'll see some active players uh in next week's episode. Um but we'll talk about that in one of our other points. Uh anything else on this on this point, Chris, or we move on to case note number Let's two. move on. All right, let's get on to Priscilla and Gaia's action-packed funeral. Um, I, I, I love, I love scenes for Priscilla now. I'm really looking forward to seeing her character every week. I'm so glad she's back here. They could have kind of ended the arc with, uh, with the discussion with Fury in last week's episode, which was fantastic, best moment of the season, I think, uh, so far. But they have her still involved here because yes. Gravix men are coming to kill her, and because Gaia needs to have, um, someone from Skrullos, someone who knows the way to give her father a proper send-off. Um, so bringing those two characters together uh, for what I thought was a really good moment. I loved the challenge from um, Priscilla to Gaia when they're having their conversation about Gravik's plan and about a place to live for Skrulls. Um, and she says to, to Priscilla, I didn't mean to offend you. And she goes, no, no, you're young. You believe everything you say is right. Of course you meant to offend. That's what young people do. <laughs> I really like that from Priscilla. It's, it's a really honest way. You know, she's still, she's someone that did work for Gravik, remember? So yep. uh, she knows all of Gravik's plans. She knows everything that guy is saying, but, um, it's just that confidence of youth versus the experience that Priscilla brings, uh, as being a lead, a leader of the scroll group going back 30 years on the planet. I thought that was a, a really good, uh, part of the conversation that's going on, but also a very respectful send off, um, for, uh, for Talos as well. Um, I don't think Talos is coming back. No. I think, I think, yes. uh, <laughs> I think we need to finally. Uh, put that to bed. Uh, a character has died in this show, and it's very unlikely we're going to get him back in the future, yeah. fortunately. No, no. Taylor, Taylor, it, it was nice to see you. It was. This is such a shame. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed Ben Mendelsohn as a character, as an actor, and I enjoyed Taylor as a character. Absolutely. Um, Gaia will probably take this point going forward in that she is the kind of substitute going forward for all scrolls mm -hmm. which is good uh, she is a good character as well absolutely Probably be a bit more prone to action as well and what we see is the usual kind of um they're they're, they're building the younger gener the newer gen the younger generation of characters mm -hmm. so um this Amelia Clark can, and Guy can kind of fill into that slot of the Anthony Mackies and the other younger Avengers, mm -hmm. especially because she is also a super school. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's a shame. It was a lovely send off, mm -hmm. but it was a shame. I, I, I would have liked to see more of him. Yeah. But, and uh, I suppose yeah. the good the good news in the Marvel Cinematic Universe now is we do have scrolls that can shape shift, shift into any character. So potentially we could have Ben Mendelsohn back. Oh yes, performing as Gaia, pretending to be Talos at some yes. point in the future. We could we could have something <laughs> as convoluted as that in the future. So uh, so that is a good thing. But yeah, I, I suppose for me, I think because we've got a TV show here uh, with with opportunity to expand, having these moments in here where they didn't just uh, leave the story with um, Gaia crying because her father's passed or her father's been yeah. murdered. Um, we have a moment where we can we can actually see the funeral. We can see that moment. I really like just like the the phrase that she says over her father her father's body with uh, travel well to your beyond. I thought that was a yeah. that was a really interesting moment that they have uh, a very a very Viking send off as well. Yeah, that's how I was thinking that too. They really go in for it. Was this the same uh, send off that uh, that um, Amelia Clark had for her husband on Game of Thrones as well? Um, wasn't he? To it. Wasn't he? Burnt in a funeral pyre as well. Um, <laughs> Very close, I yeah, think. Yeah. Um, but it was it was nice, and it was also nice to see um, Priscilla do this kind of more religious part as well, because hmm. this is going to ingrain. Potentially, we we will still see more of Priscilla. Yeah. Um, 
especially because Sin Fury admits, and we'll talk about it later, that he is married to a scroll, um, and that it's one of the reasons he 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 is going. He came back is because he personal interest in this absolutely uh, in the scrolls. Yeah. Um. So yes, I, I think this is a. It was a beautiful send off, but it does mm-hmm. get actiony quickly. It certainly does. It certainly does. The attack from uh, from Gravik's team uh, coming in from every area of the building. You know, I think it works really well because um, Gaia has the conversation with Priscilla just beforehand about why she chose this particular house. Um, because she talks about the three things that Fury had to have, um, which are uh, privacy, security, and light. I do like the joke yeah. from Gaia that he also wants leather because uh, Nick Fury loves his leather jackets. Uh, but but it's interesting that they have that conversation beforehand in this place, which is ne- which is under attack, and they defend the castle that she's found for herself and Nick. Like it is absolutely her defending her home that she's purposely chosen because it would be perfect for herself and nick in their life it's like as if she had this in mind if we ever get attacked i also have defensive positions around the home as well you know i yeah. uh, thought it worked really really well a great and a great fight sequence shows off uh, gaia's great style as well yeah and it's almost like they've trained together for a while which mm. i was laughing about <laughs> i was the one thing i was like oh they're back to back and twisting and turning and you shoot no i shoot i was like coordination i love it absolutely um you just met properly a while ago. Um, That's not true. Thirty years they've been working together, Chris. She was part of the original team that arrived on Earth with uh, with Guy. I remember. True, but we don't yeah. know whether Guy has been working with Priscilla in, in, in their training and stuff like that. It was just very. They core all worked Earth. undercover for uh, for Dick. True. Remember, okay. so uh, so I I think I would say they worked together uh, a couple of times before. So um, yeah. very cool. But either way, I also <laughs> loved the uh, the firearm based backpacks. Mm-hmm. Uh, which has front and back, which is bulletproof and space for your guns and ammo. Of course. It's the perfect. It's perfect for just what the hill- hitchhiker needs when you're kind of hiking up the mountains. It's you, you wouldn't expect anything less in Nick Fury's home, huh? No, you wouldn't. And then finally, after all the action, we get a little scene with Priscilla driving Gaia somewhere and letting her out and saying good luck, effectively. So... I do question where Guy has gone. What's the next step here? What, where has she been sent to? I thought that was a little odd that they put that in there. Uh, that moment between the two of them, they've worked together, they've defended against Gravix forces, and then Priscilla's dropping her off somewhere. Uh, I was kind of expecting that, that would come back and there was, they didn't return to, to them for the next, whatever it was, five minutes left in the episode. So, um, so obviously that's set up for next week. Uh, yeah. wherever wherever Gaia, Gaia has gone uh, that's important to whatever happens next week uh, but Gaia here being set up with the conversation with Fury being set up she has the super scroll powers he's aware of them and Gaia being set up as the one that will take down Gravik so while there is the antagonism between Fury and Gravik it looks like it's going to be down to a super scroll versus super scroll in the final episode between Gaia and, uh, and Gravik um, yeah so that's that was interesting Hopefully, I, I I do I hope that it is, but I also would like to see a hopelessly outnumbered or outmatched Fury take down. Right, <laughs> you know what I mean. Do you know, I heard it's an like, interesting one this week. Um, there was a question as to why Nick Fury didn't join the uh, the battle in Endgame, um, and apparently at the time, um, he had obviously returned after the snap, and apparently at the time, the uh, the Russo brothers had said. It's kind of a bit difficult to put someone like Nick Fury on a battlefield with hundreds of aliens coming down when all he's doing is running and shooting a few guns and he would only have, you know, two guns in his hands or maybe one pistol. So uh, so they felt it would be easier just to have him off the battlefield. So I think Marvel probably have that same feeling about Fury. He's great when he works in the shadows and maybe have the fighting team around him, um, which I think is where we get to with our final point, who he's calling and and who he's going to bring along for that final fight or who is he talking to uh, for that final moment. But um, I do feel that Nick Fury will do the thinking, he'll do the planning, he'll uh, he'll put together his uh, his idea of what he feels is going to happen, but I'm not too sure whether they're going to get uh, get, uh, punch, punch. ending to this with Fury versus Gravik, unless he delivers the final shot, maybe. Yes, true. He's the great tactician. Yes. Yeah. 
No, no, I, I agree. We just, we, 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 I just thought it'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, Maybe we'll Fury gets thrown in and he gets uh, Extremis put in him or something. Mm, interesting, Ooh. interesting. Uh, very different, a very different move from uh, from the comic books. Um, yes. Of course, he does have the Infinity Formula in him, which keeps him young, but he doesn't have much uh, much in the way of other superpowers in the comic books. So uh, it'd be interesting to make him into a, a superhuman uh, character. Um, I think that's it for our, our second case note. Let's go on to our final case note, Fury of Finland. Um, yeah, we have uh, we have Fury traveling over to Finland with a little guest star in this episode. I thought that was really interesting to see Mason back. Uh, Mason featured in uh, in Black Widow. I forgot how much I liked that character. I remember the character really well because he was he formed such a great part of the movie. He was um, the person that was always that was able to give um, Natasha Romanoff and her sister all the weapons that they needed, all the vehicles that they needed. He was someone that you could call on to get that you out of a tight situation. And I thought his his way of reacting and interacting with uh, with Natasha was fantastic. I almost felt like a little love story going on uh, between the two of them. But uh, but we have him back here um, doing the same job for Nick, which makes loads of sense because Natasha yeah. used to work with Nick. So, of course, he would be a similar contact, right? Yeah, exactly. And much like you, I took me – I saw the character and I was like, where do I know him? Why do I like him? Really? Where do I know him? Why is he cool? <laughs> oh, Yes. Um, and it's especially, it's increasingly fun as well, as well, because he, the mask that Fury uses, the Widow mask. Yes, it is. The Widow Veil. Which Widow uses in Winter Soldier. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and it's basically called the Widow mask. And I was like, oh, lovely connection. Oh, that's cool. Gadgets, yep. tech, kind of black market guy. This is cool. It's a clever thing. But yeah, no, I, I remember him now. And I was like, oh, yeah, it was good. I do kind of want to watch that again, by the way. I watched it last night. Um, Did you? The great benefit when when John's away is uh, I I um, can just rewatch things uh, over and over again. Um, <laughs> and where John would probably want to move on to something new, I'm like, oh, oh, that said, that seems good. I'll watch uh, Black Widow again. It's good fun. Really enjoyed it again. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen it quite a few times, Eternals. but I did enjoy that. Uh, really cool. And I'm good to see Mason, as I say, on 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 there. He has a has a has some good scene scenes with Fury there. I like uh, I like his final kind of dig at Fury. Get some sleep. You seem a bit grumpy. Uh, good, good little moment with him. Uh, but we also have uh, Fury landing in Finland and meeting up with Sonia Falsworth, who we haven't spoken about this episode. Let's fit in anything we want to about Sonia in uh, in this point here, Chris, because uh, she has quite a big move here. She becomes the director of MI6 or SIS um, during this episode. Yeah, from the moment she enters the the director's office, it, mm-hmm. it was great. She usual. Fu- Sonia, uh, that we've kind of grown to love over this the series, mm-hmm. um, and we know that this character was the one she spoke to back in like episode one, episode two, mm-hmm. um, and there's always like she was questioning that there was high level scrolls, mm-hmm. so you do kind of not quite sure where she's going, and as soon as she shoots him, I'm like, oh, okay, scroll, cool. yes, now yes. I understand where everything is going. Um, but, but once yes. again, I thought it was interesting. She shoots him, and it does take about thirty seconds because he's not. It's not like he's died and re- turns into a scroll. She shoots him in the leg, and it's about thirty seconds before he changes. Before you see anything of the scroll, and you're going, "Hang on a second, <laughs> has she got this right? She's just suspected the director of the SIS, or as I said, MI6, uh, as being a scroll. Maybe she's wrong here. <laughs> What's her evidence? And interestingly, I, it seems like her reasoning for suspecting him is because. Right back in episode one, it's because Fury and Talos found the contact that they were talking about in the room, and that was the only person in the room that she was talking about. So I was trying to put it together in my head, and I was going, so she suspects that he's a scroll because this information leaked, but actually it didn't leak. Fury was watching into the room, but she knows that because she has the owl that had uh, that had Fury's video camera on it. Mm. So I was trying to piece together why she suspected him, but I think we may have seen it. It may have been off screen. So, uh, so yes, um, it is a great scene. I love that moment. And I love that she's now taken over as director of SIS. Uh, that's the way accession works in the, in the secret service in the UK, is it? I yeah, guess. you shoot your boss. Shoot That's, your boss. Is that not how it works in normal corporate? Culture, how it works in, in my business? No, it doesn't. It doesn't work in my business that way. I'm not, I'm not threatening my boss. <laughs> um, uh, but she does have a great moment. She gets she gets the details out of him as to where the Daltons are, the two scientists that have been working on this scroll project, and we see them uh, confronting confronting the Daltons at their home. 
And she has a great line with them when she arrives, telling them, I could be your bestie, but I'm also devilishly good at not being your bestie, <laughs> which is which is great. Uh, she also kills um, Victor Dalton. Um, interestingly, he was trying to protect his scroll wife, I guess, is the, the person who's pretending to be Dr. Dalton. He's trying to protect her from betraying Gravik. He won't let her betray Gravik, is what he says, and tries to kill her before Sonya uh, puts a bullet between his eyes. So uh, I thought that was interesting. So it's almost like, you know, we're seeing them as a couple who are working on this project together, but it's almost like Dr. Dalton, that scroll is being made to do this project and Gravik has a fail safe in case she goes against it. She'll be killed yeah. by Victor, the other scroll, effectively. Yes. So, mm, it was interesting. Um, and it, it's fun that so we have that kind of the call out or kind of by Sonya, which is kind of paraphrasing here, which is like, yeah, me, men in any culture um, are always going to take that from the women. Yes. And it's just really fun. That, yeah. that it's, just, it, it, it's a nice nod and just kind of leads it propels us forward because i i am interested to see where i have a feeling that doctor will kind of turn up again mm-hmm. yes because that that scroll doctor essentially like a crazy geneticist mm-hmm. who managed to like so this is mi6 how do we get captured britain in the mcu there we have it we well maybe see that's yeah, it maybe, like maybe. a scroll geneticist who was able to kind of alter people's DNA, mm-hmm. and we suddenly get Captain Britain be brilliant. Maybe that's the way they'll go. You never know. You never know. But we do have Falzrick meeting, meeting up with Fury when he arrives in Finland. That's lots of Fs there. <laughs> uh, but, and they finally get a chance to sit down and kind of compare notes, which I liked. I liked that, you know, we now have Sonya being brought up to speed. The idea that she has now, uh, in her new, let's say, temporary position as the leader of, uh, of uh, the Secret Service, um, She's given Rhodey the go-ahead because she had a relationship with Rhodey in the past. She knew who Rhodey was. She'd worked with him in the past. And Fury reveals, well, he's a scroll. You've actually just given the go-ahead for the plan on behalf of England, on behalf of Britain, um, to bomb Russia uh, because of a relationship with someone that has been replaced by a scroll. So um, so I like that. We've seen Sonya question whether Fury is ahead of the game. And here Fury has the ability to tell her. Uh, hang on a second. You don't know everything. So, yeah. uh, so finally getting that a little bit of one upmanship. It's not a great piece of one upmanship. You don't want to know that. You don't want to know that you've just sent your country on the past path to nuclear war by a mistake, right? Um, but he's also revealing other elements to it. As you mentioned earlier on, he reveals to her that he is married uh, to Priscilla, a scroll. Uh, it feels like Sonia does actually know Priscilla. Um, yes. but it's, it's, he says, I was here. Um, on my honeymoon in Finland with Priscilla and then says the scrolls like the cold. And that's the moment of reveal to Sonia that she uh, she realizes, oh, wait a minute, your wife's a scroll. Um, given that Fury has hidden the fact that he's married from so many people, that kind of tells you a bit of the closeness between Sonia and Nick, a bit more of the closeness between the two of them, if he has told her, right? Yeah, I, I think... I think whether it's because Sonya is someone else. Maybe. We're kind of led to believe that they do have this relationship from the very first episode. Yeah. Where he goes to see her, or at least a previous. In the 80s, they were doing spy shit together. <laughs> ah. Um but See, I was kind of thinking of the relationship between Natasha Romanoff and, and Clint Barton, where everybody else in the Avengers, everybody in S.H.I.E.L.D. didn't know that Clint had a wife yet. Um, even Clint's kids are calling Natasha Auntie Natasha. Effectively, they they all yeah. know each other. She's the only one that knows all about the family. So, is that is Sonia that for Nick? You know, is that is that his best mate that he's able to talk to about uh, those things? But even with her, he didn't reveal that Priscilla's a scroll, but did talk about the fact that he was married. Maybe, yeah, maybe. It's a maybe. small moment, but I just wondered whether that it's was a the, fun moment. That was a reason, yeah. And they do go to Nick Fury's dead drop. His literal <laughs> dead drop. Yes, they do. One of the many, apparently. Uh, a man yeah. with uh, with um, graves all over the world. I think that's a reference to the comic books as well. Uh, Nick Fury has died at least six times. Um, 
definitely twice officially in the comics where he died for a few years and came back afterwards so i think this joke of him having uh having um gravestones all over the world for the death of nick fury is a little uh a little nod towards that i know in in the marvel cinematic universe he's died once as well so um so yeah i like that that little uh that little nod there as well yeah um but that does lead us to the harvest yes so you have a problem it's not a problem as such i know he's talking about the harvest and he's talking about taking the harvested dna to gravik and he's saying that that's what he's going to do and you know we can't believe anything until the final episode happens right that that is what nick says the plan is he's here to collect the harvested dna of all of the avengers a project that gravik worked on so Gravik that's why gravik is aware of it he does that cool uh spy thing of of uh blowing on on this um unseemly grave uh, it opens up and there's a vial inside one individual vial with a liquid inside it. Is that the way you would store the Avengers DNA? Would you not separate it out to have a vial for each of them? You'd think that. That's where I... Yes, I would think that too. But I think it's just like, rather than having another case within a, a thing, it was just like, this makes it look cool. It's a vial of all their DNA. Or is it like a vial of COVID that he's going to give to Gravik and make him inject himself with pure COVID? Is it something like that? <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's a that's literally a dirty bomb. Um, no, I, I think it's just supposed to be that it's it, it it's just a it vial looks of cool. all. The, yeah, that's okay. the way I took it. Okay. Um, it was it it was it was cool to understand what the harvest was. Uh-huh. That yeah, all the Avengers bled during Endgame and in Wakanda and. Mm-hmm. Even he Carol furies. Danvers is cold out as well. Yeah. Miss, even Miss Marvel bled. Uh, yeah. yeah. And Fury basically sent Gravik to lead a team of Skrulls to go in and pick up all the DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, it, it's a cool idea. Yeah. Um, and it explains why Fury hasn't brought in any of the other Avengers now, mm. because if they fight Gravik, or did they go after Gravik? He wins anyway, because he just has to cut kind of, uh, Falcon mm-hmm. and, or Captain America now. And he gets that DNA yeah. done. That's it. Like all you have to do is just cut them slightly and then you get the DNA. So he yeah. explains partially why Fury is reluctant in calling in the big guns mm-hmm. and why he wants to do it himself old school. With eye patch and trench coat and all. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. I did like him uh, tooling up. I thought that was very cool. I wish he'd just shaved that beard off, um, just so he make. I him just wish. I understand. Back. Like, you see the the eye patch do something, like just kind of it turned on and went, and like you saw it was. Other than that, he's just put on and like he just put it on for like fashion choice. It's for the for the effect, man. He's uh, he he doesn't want to look like the hobo that he's been looking like for the last uh, last five episodes. He wants to get himself looking back like he was as the director of Shield. That's uh, that's what it looks like. Um, did you think there was there was too many sections that he had to open up in the yes. uh, <laughs> to get all that he, stuff? I'm sure that all could have fit into one. Uh, it would have into it one would box, have. wouldn't it? Literally, you could have just put the like the gun and the uh-huh. eye patch on top of the coat, and boom, yep. Bob's your uncle. And then you would only have to open one lone wolf box <laughs> that was very because cool. it was a wolf <laughs> icon i was like i was trying to figure out if it was like oh is this kind of like a black panther thing like right. white tie the white wolf and it was just like they're saying that maybe he's taking on some of it no nope no nope. nope, it's just a no lone no. wolf i got it now okay it's just a wolf and, and it wasn't actually in the episode either because they did edit it properly where it just has it opening up but i did have this image of nick going around to like 15 boxes and going <laughs> into each one as he went by blowing into each one to make them open up uh, so that he could get the piece of equipment that's behind door number six you know um it's probably been a bit of while since he's been in finland you know maybe he's yeah. forgotten which which uh, box holds which oh, no, piece no. of equipment each bullet each bullet for his gun uh, <laughs> so, and it's right. different box. the full mag <laughs> just takes a while to go through <laughs> that's it hopefully he doesn't have uh he doesn't have a, a, a massive gun with tons of bullets so, uh, hopefully it's just a six shooter um but it is interesting. It does it does set us up for next episode. This is um this is his plan 
to now go straight for Gravik. Gravik has given the offer to him. If you give me the harvest, I'll call the whole thing off effectively. So as I said, this seemed more like a plan for Gravik, not a plan for the Skrull race to stay on the planet. So that, again, we won't know until next week, but that feels like now we've turned him into the villain of the show who you can take out without it being Nick Fury versus a million scrolls on Earth, yes, right? Exactly. We'd, we'd already said it was only going to be him and his followers. He Gravik's taken out his followers now, and now it's going to be mano a mano versus, uh, versus Fury and Gaia and Sonya and uh, Priscilla, I guess, yeah. next week as well. So, uh, so it may be a bigger team um, on Fury's side. So, question. Mm-hmm. Did he call Gaia? Or did he call someone else? My theory on this Go on. Go is on, that he called Maria theory. Hill. Yeah! Yeah, he did. Yeah. Well, I, d- I don't know. He, he could have called anybody. The, the, the fact that we had, you know, the first introduction to Captain Marvel was him calling out to space to bring Carol Danvers back to Earth to to fight in, in the in the battle uh with um with Thanos. That's an indication that it could also be his call out now to Carol Danvers to get her back. She's been mentioned almost every episode. The fact that we have Maria Hill as guest star every single episode, the the only way that Nick could prove his innocence to not killing her, or a really easy way for Nick to prove his innocence and in not killing her is to show that she's still alive, right? So call her out of hiding. It's time now. Let's go. Um, he could have also been calling Gaia because, as we as we mentioned earlier on, Priscilla's dropping her off yeah. to get something, to do something, to set up something. So he could have been calling her to say, right, it's time. Let's go. He's done his trip to Finland. So it could be as simple as that, you know. Um, I'd like something a little more than that. I'd like more people. Uh, it, hopefully, it's a call to Coulson to get the get get the whole Agents of Shield gang back <laughs> together, and we get uh, we get Quake and, and the full team uh, back in fighting alongside Fury. That'd be cool too. I I'm of the opinion it is Maria Hill. I think now they they killed off Talos. Mm-hmm. He is dead, 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 dead. Yeah, he is never coming back. Maria Hill. I think that's the nice twist. That, like, nope, she wasn't, like, Fury has been ahead of this. Three steps always ahead. Mm -hmm. Since day one. Since him coming back. And, like, he, him and Maria knew there were scrolls in the pub. So they had the fight in front of everyone where Mm -hmm. she calls and questions. And then Gravik kind of echoes parts of that conversation as well, mm-hmm. saying that Fury's done. So we have all that and it's all played back, so they devise the plan where Maria is going to disappear. She's mm-hmm. going to sacrifice, she wears she's not an LMD version, but she something happens, or Talos gives Gaia the gun that Gravik used to shoot and it was kind of a special gun or a special like, bullet or squib or something. Okay. And that's what this whole lot is. And the person who spoke to Fury, who was Maria Hill's mother, was Priscilla. All these. Like, okay. That's how I could see it all kind of <laughs> playing out. Okay. If it is her. I hope that's it. Because it's, if it's just a call to Gaia, mm-hmm. we know Gaia is going to do something anyway. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's on. It's like, yeah, well, we knew because she just got dropped off. <laughs> um. Because I know where she's going. But it does connect to the conversation that Fury had with Gaia in the episode where he said, I've got to go to Finland. And she was going off to meet Priscilla. And yeah. if you connect those two conversations, he's going, right, I've gone to Finland. I've got what I needed. It's time. Let's finish this. You know, yeah. um, you're by my side. So it does make logical sense. It, it makes it, it would be no stretch of imagination no. at all that he's calling Gaia and they're tooling up for the final mission. You know, there's, there's no stretch there at all. I just feel because of the mention of this information being released that Nick Fury is now the most wanted man on the planet, the easiest way or the best way to disprove that would be bringing Maria Hill back to go, well, I didn't kill her because she's not dead, right? So, yeah. um, or Gaia becomes Maria Hill from now on. Uh, maybe. Yeah, see. But then you don't have Amelia Clark. Yeah. See, that's the thing. I was like, yeah. Um, I think, see, the problem, again, I kind of know where Gaia's gone. Because of marketing, 
Okay. Because there's a scene in the trailer. Oh, okay. That we, from like, one of the original trailers. Yeah, I, I don't remember it. I no. don't want to so know. I'm not going to tell uh, you. So, like, we, that's we've the got thing. six days to wait, Chris. Exactly. And we'll find out so, next week. <laughs> I just don't, I, I think it, I, I will be very happy that I think it's Maria Hill. Um, now, again, every other piece that you said makes sense. Could <clears> be Carol. Could be Gaia. Could yeah. just be Priscilla. Could be Ant Man. Yeah. Like, like Colson, Quake, it could be anyone. And I think a lot of those options are open. Mm-hmm. I just hope it's not the kind of obvious guy at one. I think that would just be nice. <laughs> I feel like but it might be there. You said six days. <laughs> six days to go. Six days to go. Uh, let's get to our final point as we usually do each week. Uh, who do you trust? We're down to the pointy end now. Um, I think if we don't trust someone now, um, they're, they're on the bad side, right? So we yes. don't trust Rody now. <laughs> definitely um we don't trust gravic now um i don't think his his uh the team behind him should be trusting gravic now either i think he should be uh, left all on his own to try and carry out his plan um we trust fury of course we trust yep. gaia now and gaia and priscilla together now yeah do we, yep. do we trust priscilla now she's not going to turn on gaia and report yeah, the do. fact that she's turned on gravic to no. gravic right yep. um anybody else uh that we have do trust we trust do we, do we trust mason uh mason who just appeared yes. in this episode to give uh, to give Nick his uh, his items to get across the border into Finland. Yes, we, we trust, trust them all. We trust Mason. Good stuff. The only question, Mark, that still is out there, which hopefully is addressed in episode six, mm-hmm. Gaia's mother. Yes. She's also been mentioned every yes. single episode of the show. Yep. Um, exactly. Just the one thing on that here, a little bit of a, a more finality to it, where we have... Um, Gaia leaving her mother's wedding ring on yep. the burning body of Talos on the before she sets fire to the pyre. Um, so that that to me felt like a bit more finality than we just the hearsay of she died off screen that we yeah. had, had had heard in the previous episodes. But she has been mentioned every episode, so um, that would be interesting to see her back. Yeah. Um, and then we are we are saying that we may not trust Maria Hill because. Maria Hill could come back next week, and we've yes. believed she's been dead since the first episode. So yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, I, I just think with the with Gaia's mother, I think it, it it's a good one to have her back, mm-hmm. and it'd be an interest. It's a good piece. But that being said, it is also good motivation in the final episode where uh, Gaia and Gravik are fighting, and it's you killed my mother mm-hmm. and you killed my father. Absolutely, prepare to die. Uh, prepare to be avenged. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I will avengers you. Absolutely. Prepare to die. Good stuff. Any notes, Chris, about this episode? Anything else you want to talk about before we uh, close it out? Nope. Nothing from my side on this one. Good stuff. I think we've talked about everything. I just wanted to make mention of this. And again, I just thought it was a fun little uh, nod and probably, in this case, unintentional. Um, when Rhodey says that they're going to, that he wants the president to drop the bombs and take and, and kill the scrolls uh, who are living in Russia, um, what he actually said is, cut this thing off at the head, which was always the motto of Hydra, cut off the head and two more will take its place. I just think it's interesting that this old phrase about Hydra is used to describe what Rody wants to do to to the scrolls living in, uh, in Russia, or at least he's being told to do. I just thought it was a little interesting nod, given Nick Fury's main villain all, all the way through it, 70 years or 60 years of comic books has always been um, Hydra, so... I thought that was a good dot. It was fun. Yeah. It stood out to me. It stood out to me anyway. Uh, that's it. That's the end of our discussion overall about this episode. Um, Chris, do you defend Secret Evasion Episode 5, Harvest? I do. Um, the My literally only down point, and it's not even a down point, it is that, it, again, a short episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and that being said, it's not, doesn't detract from the episode being uh, the, the 30-something minutes. It's more that I wish... Give me an extra five or kind of ten without padding just to give me more of Sonya and Fury in the car. <laughs> Reminiscing for like a two minute dialogue. Let's get that full rap track on there and get Sonya singing along to it. Yeah, we exactly. <laughs> uh, it Are we perfect. doing this? We're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it would just be fun. Yeah. But overall, I do completely defend this. Excellent. Derek, what about yourself? Do you defend this episode of... Secret Invasion. I love this episode. Yes, really good. Um, I think this is just a really tight show. Um, I think that's probably why 
as I say, this, the fact that you get to the end of the episode and you go, wow, that was 30 minutes. Look how much they crammed in there. It's like they're shaving everything off to make it really tight. It's interesting that there is a lot of criticism that the show's slow from people who are, who are watching. And I do feel it's almost like you're watching this spy show and you want to get to the end of it. So is it slow? Is Does this show feel slow to you when you're spending time with the characters? It's It doesn't to me. Um, it, to me, they're telling a wider story and have more time to expand on the characters that you wouldn't get in a movie. And I think it wor- it's working really well for me. By the end of the season, it's going to be almost three hours, I think. Um, or maybe a little bit more than that, maybe four, uh, four and a half hours in total. Um, that's not much longer than a movie in total. So personally, this is my type of show. It's not running slowly for me, and I'm really excited to see uh, how it's going to close out next week. I thought this is a great penultimate effort episode setting everything up for that, that finale uh, next week. But I just can't believe it's going to be over after waiting uh your well, life. How, how old am I now? <laughs> They're waiting 34 years to see a good uh, Nick Fury TV show. Um, and it's going to be over in a week's time. That's awful. That's awful. But anyway, it's over. looking forward to it, uh, as always, as always. Uh, let's get off to the pub, Chris. Let's do it. Yes, we have the fifth question in our Secret Invasion pub quiz. Um All you need to do is gather together the answers to all of the questions that we've given out throughout the season. One more question to come next week. There'll be six six questions. You just gather together the questions, provide the answers to us, email them to us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com, and you could be in with a chance of getting your hands on some secret invasion goodies. The question for this week is, what does Sonia Falsworth say podcasts are full of? And the answer is not gorgeously handsome men. It's not. You can't see me grinning. The answer is not gorgeously handsome men. Yes. Are you saying we're not gorgeously handsome, Chris? Well, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just saying that's not what Sonia Falsworth says. <laughs> it's not She that. is wrong because it is gorgeously handsome men. That's it. Exactly. Ding. I have the Colgate ding and everything. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, yeah, I thought that would be an appropriate question for this week. It is. Definitely. So just a reminder again, all the questions at the end of the next episode to feedback at TV podcast industries. Dot com. And that question once again is what does Sonia Falsworth say podcasts are full of? Yes. Now, this episode of TV Podcast Industries is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Johnny Million. Thank you so much, Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. If you want to be like Johnny, you can support us for any monthly amount by going on over to patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries. Or if you'd like to support us on a one-off donation, you can head on over to buymeacoffee.com slash TVBI and buy us a one-off coffee to help keep the lights and mics going. And in the case of a coffee, keeping our editor-in-chief in caffeine, because you know that's what he needs. Mm. But... You ain't got the books. Don't worry. You can support us by subscribing to the podcast and sharing it with your friends, family, grannies, scrolls, and anyone in New Scrollios. <laughs> because we're sharing the podcast is what, Derek? It's, of course, sharing the love. Of course. Good stuff. Thanks, everybody, for your support. Really good uh, to have your support throughout this season of uh, of Secret Invasion. Hope you stay on with us as well for lots of other stuff coming up this year. Uh, I think it's time to get over to our feedback section. We've got an email in, Chris. Yes, let's jump in. First up, the email from Coffee and Vodka, who had this to say. Greetings, fellow Harvest Gatherers Defenders. A nice explainer episode surrounded by some well-placed action and writing. Graphic didn't kill Fury because he still needed something from Nick and Sonya. Weren't working across purposes, sort of. And it turns out she didn't know everything. A few sticking points. Nick's 180 degree judgment of Earth's need or lack thereof of supers. Strange coming from the man who brought them together. A single vial presumably carrying a cocktail of Avengers DNA rather than separate samples. Mm -hmm. The president presumably not reaching out to the Russian government prior to an attack. Mm -hmm. And of course, the very sudden heel turn of Gravik that felt more plot driven than natural. Mm -hmm. Nitpicking aside, it settled the matters of scope greatly, turning it into a personal chess match between Fury and Gravik, making it a matter of personal pride for Nick and personal power for Gravik. Throwing Gaia and Priscilla's castle defense, Talos's funeral, Fury's fugitive status, 
it made some very tight and entertaining 37 minutes. At any time, you can put Mr. Jackson and Mrs. Coleman in the same place. It's always a bonus. Mm -hmm. Finally, loved the name Nick chose for himself to get into Finland. Think you could talk to the House of Mouse about making the final episode an hour and a half? Just curious. Four revolting scrolls, large men, and vile vials out of five. Peace and take care, coffee and vodka. Thanks so much for the feedback, coffee and vodka. Um, you sent us down a rabbit hole. We've uh, we've gone off on Google to find out what uh, what Nick Fury's name was and what the meaning was because uh, <laughs> we didn't get it. We we, we didn't uh, we didn't catch it when we were watching the episode. Uh, so it's Mister Kerhonen, and apparently Google tells us that uh, Kerhonen in Finland um, is used as a term to describe somebody who's elderly, aloof, clumsy, silly, or foolish, which loads of people have been accusing uh, Fury of uh, throughout the season so far. So I guess that's the joke. I wouldn't have got that at all if uh, if you hadn't pointed that out, Coffee and Vodka. Yeah, thanks, Coffee and Vodka. I would have just taken it as like it's, he went in as Joe Smith. Yeah. But it's a Finnish Joe Smith. It's it's Joe Kerhonen, um, Yeah, <laughs> the elderly, aloof uh, person. There you go. <laughs> thanks so much, Coffee and Vodka. I see that you caught, caught the same thing as I did about the single vial um, carrying all the Avengers DNA. Uh, it does seem like a little bit odd, but I presume you could break up, you could find individual strands of DNA. I guess that's the point, right? You don't need to keep them all separated, but I'd probably keep them all separated for and, and, and tagged uh, personally. <laughs> um, Nick Fury's turn on whether the Earth needs supers. I wonder, is this something to do with what his opinion of the Sokovia Accords would have been? Um about the amount of damage that superheroes could do if they land in a place and the collateral damage that they could do would Nick Fury be for the Sokovia Accords, maybe? Um, because effectively his choice here is he's saying he doesn't want to have any innocent humans or any innocent scrolls killed if he calls in uh, one of his special friends, they may uh, kill uh, someone unexpectedly or how uh, there may be collateral damage that would take out one, some of the innocents that are there so uh, and there's also obviously the point um, that if he brings them in and it is someone that is super powered they could take the DNA and uh, create an even more powerful super scroll yeah. so so two reasons why he doesn't want to bring in uh, these guys and then the third reason that he's giving is it's personal it's his fault he's the one that started it if he hadn't sent gravic gravic out on that harvesting team gravic wouldn't even know about uh, the idea of set of giving himself superpowers through the dna of, of other uh, superheroes so uh, so he has a couple of reasons um but yes he is of course the one that set up the avengers in the first place so it is interesting the iron suit around the world kind of that was his original plan him and Iron Man's original plan. That was Tony's original plan, yes. His yeah. his plan was to put together a team of uh, the best trained humans and super powered humans uh, to fight off any alien threats. So, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Thanks, Coffee and Vodka. Uh, over on Facebook, Lindsay Lowis says, Penultimate episode was short but sweet. Not sure if it hyped me up for the finale per se. I still feel the story would have been best told in film format. That said, I am still intrigued to see how Gravik vs. Fury goes down. A special highlight of the episode for me would be Sonya. Olivia Coleman's performance is sublime as she combined her character's competence with comedic timing. Another perhaps would be some of the scrolls in New Scrollers trying to stop Gravik. I like the infighting amongst his ranks and how not everybody agrees with them. Not so highlight for me is the seeming finality of Talos' fate. I understand why they did it, but it doesn't make it less annoying to kill off a great character that had an amazing dynamic with Fury. Anyway, thanks for the time and curious to hear your thoughts on this episode as well. Cheers. Thanks, Lindsay. That's really good to hear that you're that you at least enjoyed most of the episode, and hopefully uh, you will get hyped for the finale. Um, yeah, it is it is sad to see uh, Talos is gone for sure, but uh, but yeah, lots of great moments with Sonya in the episode. Yeah, no, I, I think while we've lost Ben Mendelsohn, we gained Olivia Cohn. Like exactly. this, that's the thing. <laughs> that's like the thing. you've got to look at the positives and the negatives. Exactly. Exactly. Is the glass half full, or is 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 there an eye, or is an eye patch? It's fine. We also got some feedback over on Facebook from Heather Wallace, who had this to say. As soon as Fury said he was going to Finland, I thought of Natasha's hideout, but I wasn't expecting OT Fagbandly to pop up. So good to see him. I really liked him in Black Widow. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why Gaia and Priscilla are still walking around with those faces when other scrolls think Gaia is dead and are hunting Priscilla. And why didn't they change during Talos' funeral? 
I know there's a production reason why, not covering up recognisable main actors and scroll makeup, but doesn't make sense in-universe. One of the highlights of the episode was Gravik's rage during the fight with his followers, mm. and then roaring at the others in the compound to try and take him. So far, his emotions have been very controlled. That fight brought out how dangerous he is. I really want to see he and Sonya go head-to-head. It would be a memorable fight. She's <laughs> fantastic. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. Yes, why didn't um, Gaia and uh, and Priscilla choose different faces? Um I suppose Priscilla hasn't really gotten out of the house yet. Yep. Um, she's she's staying there and saying if they're going to come to attack, they're going to come to attack. So she's not particularly in hiding. Um, but I wonder, Gaia does actually make a comment to Nick that she'll put on a good face uh, yep. when the cops are coming. So I think she actually does use a different face and then uses her Gaia face when she goes to visit Priscilla and then they're attacked there. So, um, so I think that's just a nod, but you're probably right, Heather. It is probably that they didn't want to do uh, an extra amount of uh, of morphing to uh, to move them from their scroll faces back to their human faces or onto a different human face. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, I do think that Gaia has changed in between her conversation with Nick just because of that line. Yeah, and they yeah. did they did talk about how easy it is for when you have taken a new face as a scroll, or uh, how easy it is to be detected by other scrolls. If it's a new um, face, long- exactly, yeah. Yes, exactly. The longer yeah. they are in a face, the harder it is for sc- even scrolls to tell they are a scroll. Mm-hmm. So, uh, again, slightly in the universe, not really the answer. We know the answer mm-hmm. why, but it's a, it's another potential. Absolutely. Always trying to explain away. <laughs> Some things like that. Good stuff. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Dr. Bob Phillips says, Marvel, I was only joking about the episode shrinkage problem, not requesting more of it. It'll be impossible to pick just three moments from this episode. The resurrection of Fury, the sass of an English spy mistress, the most badass pair of Skrullian warriors fighting their way to safety, the honouring of a very good Skrull, mutiny, roots and Rody, plus more, I'm sure. Can't wait to hear your thoughts and the thoughts of everyone. I think we were able to get three points out of it, but I think that probably um, spanned across probably about eight different points, uh, just shoved into three headings. (laughs) <laughs> that's the way we usually do isn't it <laughs> it is but it's also it's okay Marvel we understand that uh, shrinkage problems are a problem but they don't have to be a problem for life if you just go to Dr. Bob I'm sure he can prescribe something that will <laughs> get rid of your shrinkage problem hopefully Dr. in time Dr. for the Bob. finale and it'll be exactly. uh, three times as long next time exactly and that's what, that. that's just what it says on the packet that's the marketing who knows it could be as long as you want Marvel as exactly. long as you want Exactly. Uh, thanks, Dr. Bob. Victor Von Doom says, Greetings, Defenders. Sorry to see Talos die. When I first heard his name, I couldn't help but think of the bronze giant from the old Ray Harryhausen film. Gravik seems to be losing his grip on leadership and reality and seems to want to sacrifice his own people. Even Scrody suspects his reasoning. Regarding Betos' revolt, did they really think they could beat Gravik to death? Did they not see what he did to Pagon? Could Fury not have killed Scrody and Bodyguard and presented two scroll bodies to the government? Sonya is quickly becoming my favourite character. She goes about her business coldly and objectively, but always with a charming smile and sassy quips. Reminds me a little of Val, except for her taste in rap. Audacity rocks. I wonder why Gaia did not use her new powers against the assassins. Still a great action scene with two badass females. I am sure Fury plans to hand over a fake harvest to Gravik. In the final scene, when Fury says, it's time, let's finish this, I hope Carol Danvers finally shows up, or Doctor Strange casts a spell to make all the scrolls think they're cows. Looking forward to TVPI podcast and Defenders feedback. Excelsior, Victor Von Doom. Good stuff, Victor. Some interesting yeah. points in there. Um, one of the things that you mentioned there is whether uh, Skull, Skrull Rhodey um, and his bodyguard could have been killed by Nick Fury. Uh, I think they've made a point, actually, that the bodyguard isn't a Skrull because he still has the broken arm that Fury gave him back in uh, the second episode. So I don't think his bodyguard's a Skrull. I think his bodyguard's a human, and he doesn't know that Rhodey's a Skrull um, because we don't actually see Rhodey talk about his plans in front uh, or the scroll plans in front of this guy do we no no so like and again if fury shoots roadie they're going to just they're not even going to ask questions they're just going to shoot they're just going to shoot yeah and there was a load of the guys there yeah. instantaneously as well yeah um so no definitely um that they, they they it's just roadie or scrody um is the scroll um 
And just on the Gaia using her new powers, I don't think she knows what they are yet. I don't think she's fully... She's been on the go. She hasn't really had the time to potentially groot herself up. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about that. Yeah, because we know that she has just the extremist power. So far, yes. That's yeah. what, the only thing we're aware of. Because I, I think that's what she t- what she chose from the options to give herself the extremist power so that if she got killed, then she'd come back to life or she'd be able to um, be able to come back to life. We don't know if she has all the rest of the powers. So that's interesting. Uh, maybe that's where that's the mission. Maybe she's been sent to um, to get more powers uh, yeah. added, added to herself uh, for the next episode. But um, but I think she was able to handle herself pretty well without uh, without using any powers at all as well. Yeah, no, it, it, it definitely. Um, and then just on the, the the last point about Doctor Strange cast spell to make all the scrolls think they're cows, <laughs> that is a Classic very reference. weird comment. But for anyone else, but for any comic book fans, it makes mm-hmm. sense because essentially the very first scrolls in Marvel Comics in the Fantastic Four uh, were uh, brainwashed into thinking at the end of it that they were cows. That's right, uh, and it became a big thing uh, for a long time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. One of the worst things that uh, uh, Mister Fantastic did. Yes, because it led to the first scroll invasion, right? So, yep. uh, yes, very cool. Thanks so much for that, Victor. Um, on the revolt, um, did they think they could beat Gravik? I think they actually got pretty close to beating Gravik. Um, and if you don't agree with your leader's thoughts, and he's telling you you have no name and um, don't have any ability to question his orders, you take your shot, right? Um, I don't think they were trying to sacrifice themselves. I think they did see what he did to Pagan and kind of went, well, we'll take an opportunity and maybe we'll catch him off guard and maybe yeah. we'll be able to take him out. But the point is, I suppose, that these lieutenants weren't willing to follow him anymore. They realized he's gone mad with power and they want to take him out. Um, so whether they were successful or not, I feel like they failed in their attempt, but um, it wasn't necessarily that they didn't think they could do it because I think they got pretty close, especially with the bag over his head and all four of them holding him down. I think they got pretty close with uh, uh, with taking him out. Yeah, they, again, they don't know. They were not aware of how strong he was. If he was just a normal scroll with extremists and a bit of Groot powers, maybe they think they could have got away with it. Yeah. Um, well, they nearly did. They nearly did. They nearly did. Thanks so much, Victor. Yes, thank you so much, Victor. We also got a message from Jeff Charles who had this to say, Mrs. Fury is every bit of badass as she should be. Hear, hear. Hear, hear, Jeff. <clears throat> there can only be one badass wife for a badass Fury. Absolutely. Absolutely. And she's perfect. Uh, lower in the show. I'm looking forward to seeing some more of her uh, in the rest of the season. Great stuff. Thanks so much to everybody for the feedback. If you want us to share your feedback with us, of course, you can email us at any time to feedback at TV podcast industries or pop on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash TV podcast industries. Thanks so much for joining us for the penultimate episode of the secret invasion podcast on TV podcast industries. We'll be back next week, hopefully with John as well uh, for our finale discussion on this season. Uh, We'll also be starting our coverage of good omens season two that kicks off on the 28th of July, which is also next week. Uh, And we'll be continuing our cover uh, coverage of the Witcher part two of season three, which launches on the 27th of July, which is also next week. Um, I don't know how we're going to do uh, all of those at exactly the same time. Uh, we'll work it out, but that's what we're covering uh, coming up on TV Podcast Industries. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week. And in the immortal words of the good old Cockney John, <laughs> keep watching, keep listening, and oi, governor, be careful who you trust. Uh a Cockney's a Londoner. That's the other end of the country. A highly offensive, Chris. Uh, Mancurian? Um, Liverpudlian? Uh, Liverpudlian or Mancunian? Mancunian. Ah, oh, the Mancurian <laughs> candidate. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> the, Man- <laughs> <laughs> the Mancurian candidate. The guy from Manchester. Uh, <laughs> who's placed in the government. Uh, yes. Thanks very much, Chris. Great to see you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Talk to you again next time. Bye. Bye.